On April 24th, 2013, in Dhaka, Bangladesh, more than 1,100 people were killed when Rama Plaza, an eight-story garment manufacturing factory, collapsed. In the previous November, another garment factory burned down, resulting in more than 100 deaths. The $20 billion garment industry represents about 80% of Bangladesh's export volume and had grown nearly 25% in the preceding year. Bangladesh has become the preferred supply source for a global group of clothing manufacturers and retailers competing in a garment category known colloquially as fast fashion. These are apparel items expected to stay in fashion for only a brief time, in some cases just weeks, before they are replaced with more current or timely items. Because they are purchased so frequently, the market demands that they be sold at very low price points and therefore they must be manufactured at very low cost points. Such low costs result in relatively low wages and sometimes substandard safety conditions for employees. This is the presumed cause of the Rama Plaza disaster. Reactions and recommendations came from a wide variety of sources including local and foreign governments, many different human rights NGOs, student associations, industry associations, labor unions, and individual corporations. Recommendations have ranged from cries for stronger government regulation, demands that retailers abandon their fast fashion strategies, requiring retailers to monitor wage and working conditions more closely, stronger reinforcement of local standards by factory owners, closer management of agents and representatives and supply chain, and so on. I'm Dan Sweeney, the director of the Institute for Enterprise Ethics at the Daniels College of Business at the University of Denver. The Institute would like to put this, this issue of management of the apparel supply chain in a larger context and ask two questions. First, how can the industry balance its responsibility to serve its customers' needs and to compete aggressively for their business with the responsibility to protect the human and safety rights of the, of the employees in the factories that make their products. And secondly, what, if any, is the limit of the buyer's ethical responsibility for the well-being of the employees of a different corporation in a developing country, and can that responsibility be shared? Well, we are very fortunate this morning to have two very well-qualified experts to help us deal with this question. Professor Dan Bach is an associate professor in the Department of Marketing at the Daniels College of Business at the University of Denver. Professor Bach specializes in brand management and international marketing and is a principal in the Brand Cartography Consulting Group. Dan has recently introduced his first book, International Marketing, published by Sage Publications in 2013. Dennis Reeves is a consultant in retail merchandising and supply chain management with a special expertise in the apparel industry. He has recently completed assignments at Old Navy and at Gap Stores. From 1998 to 2002, Dennis was Senior Vice President and General Merchandise Manager for several soft line and hard line categories at Walmart stores. Prior to that, Dennis served as CEO and in other senior positions for a number of U.S. department stores. Dan, Dennis, welcome to Denver and the, and the uh, Daniels College of Business and to this interview. We're delighted to have you with us. Well, thank you for having us here. Yeah, thank you, Dan. So, gentlemen, let's get on with the issue. First, Dan, can you give us some background on the, on the demand side of this issue that may be driving some, some of the uh, disasters like we're seeing in Bangladesh? Well, it's a, a complicated question uh, with a complicated answer. Uh, the textile industry is a very complicated global industry. It's arguably the world's first mass-produced product with roots really back to the Industrial Revolution. And even with all of the technological changes and advances over the last 300, 350 years, you still see a really large component of the overall cost of production being labor. So really the, the largest single driver of this process uh, and, and that leads to these disasters such as we saw in Bangladesh is the global sourcing and the movement of companies uh, to low-cost producers. So Bangladesh currently their minimum wage is $37 a month. This is one of the lowest if not the lowest minimum wage uh, globally for a country that's developed enough to actually have a minimum wage. Uh, 
and it's been referred to as the China price, meaning that it is the lowest cost and that makes Bangladesh um, very dependent on and very appealing for companies that are doing a lot of textile production. So if I was going to give a single answer to the question, I would say labor costs in this process where textile companies move to the lowest cost producing country. But there are really lots of other factors involved. Increased price sensitivity for consumers um, during the economic downturn and then coming out of that downturn globally, uh, global regulatory practices and how those influence this process. And then this fast fashion concept that you brought up in the introduction is also a driver of this. This increased focus on efficiency. Initially, efficiency was something done in developing countries to give them a competitive advantage as companies started to leave southeastern the United States, uh, the United Kingdom, similar places. The idea was, well, we can be more efficient. Developing countries and least developed countries, Bangladesh is uh, typically classified as a least developed country by the United Nations, have taken on this same sort of high efficiency approach. And what this means then in the case of fast fashion, what you're trying to do is get these Paris runway, New York runway fashions out to middle, upper middle class consumers as quickly as possible. So you have this real high turnover and this real focus on efficiency and getting things out as quickly as possible. In the case of the Bangladesh disaster, they actually were working overtime, working um, extra hours because they were behind on meeting an order because of this focus on efficiency and getting the product out as quickly as possible. Uh, one last driver is just the global market for these goods. You have an emerging global middle class. So you see exporting not just to the typical Western developing countries, but to China, to middle class consumers in India, to Brazil, to uh, other emerging markets that have this middle class. So that just increases the churn, increases the demand, and increases the sensitivity. Good. Excellent observations. Dennis, do you have anything to add to this? Well, a, a little different perspective perhaps. Uh, Dan's right in that the industry has uh, dramatically grown over the last number of years. But also, there is a little bit of a misnomer over what might be classified as fast fashion. Because the reality is apparel generally will turn sometime between four and six times a year. So the expectation is that you're going to sell through that inventory within 10 to 13 weeks. And that is true whether you're dealing in a lower price range or in a higher price range. So to say that the disasters are caused as a result of, you know, turn or the price point of the uh, product is really uh, not quite, uh, I would not necessarily agree with, because there is no reason where that would drive poor safety standards or human rights violations. And most retailers would not uh, and do not have uh, any tolerance for violations on either safety or uh, human rights violations. So the issues are not necessarily being driven by you know the product being at a low price point or even a high price point. They're really more driven by whether or not the competing country or competing factory uh, is up to the same standards as what may exist in other countries. And as you have global sourcing, and there is certainly, as Dan has pointed out, growth of sourcing throughout a lot of different countries, Bangladesh is a very small percentage of the total uh, production of apparel today. It's only about $20 billion, which is a relatively small amount of apparel manufacturing. Uh, within the industry. And because it is small and it is developing and it, it is uh, a, uh, somewhat backward in many of the aspects of what exists in standards of the other countries, you have violations like this that will take place and unfortunately result in d disasters like the one that just took place. Good. Thanks, guys. Those are some two very interesting perspectives. Thank you. So, Dan, let me start with you again. Where do you think the fundamental ethical responsibility for averting these this disasters rest? Could it be with local governments, with the factory owners, with the, the agents and representatives, the buyers, uh, the ultimate consumer, or is it some combination of all of these parties? You don't ask any easy questions. <laughs> <laughs> I think to some degree, obviously, it's a combination of all parties. I think all parties find this issue to be important. I think it would be unfair to say that businesses or consumers or governments aren't concerned with this issue. 
Uh, but I feel in the end, uh, there are really two parties that bear the, the most responsibility, partially because I think they're the two parties that have the best ability to have a long-term influence on this problem. Um, I think governments play a very large role in this process. I think there are regulatory structures in place that have changed over the last three, four decades that play a role. Uh, but I think that they represent kind of the collective political will of the countries that are involved. And in the case of Bangladesh, as Dennis mentioned earlier, they just don't have the same kind of political structure in place that we'd see in a China or in India uh, or in some of the other countries where you do some of this uh, sourcing. And one of the primary responsibilities of a government, obviously, is protection of its citizens. And worker safety is one of those fundamental issues that governments need to focus on. And in the case of Bangladesh, uh, the problem seems to be more in enforcement than it seems to be with the laws that were actually in the books or the agreements that had actually been made. There was an inspector who came to the factory the day before it collapsed, saw that there were structural issues in the buildings, uh, in the building, told the workers that they had to leave. Uh, the permitting for the building was not for a factory. It was for office work, so it wasn't designed structurally to support the machinery that's involved in this production. So there were laws on the books. There were inspectors that were actually inspecting, but there wasn't enforcement. About a quarter of the legislature in Bangladesh is made up of owners of textile manufacturing businesses. There's a lot of political corruption. Uh, there's not a lot of enforcement. Um, in the case of the fire uh, last year, nobody went to jail. In this case, there has been more enforcement, um, but it took a thousand people dying mm. for them to, to take actions. So I think governments play a large role in this. And there's a lot of corruption um, in many of these countries, Bangladesh being um, one of the worst examples of it. And I think in the end, a lot of the responsibility also rests with the consumer. And I don't know how particularly sensitive consumers are to this issue. I don't think that you've seen some action by religious organizations, global labor organizations, some typical actors, but I don't know how sensitive consumers are to the sourcing of textiles. It's very complex. It's something that consumers struggle to understand, and I don't know that in the end, consumers, when they go to make a purchase at Target or Walmart or wherever they're buying their T-shirt, care where it's produced. Good, good observations, thanks. Dennis, anything you'd like to add to this? What may not be, let me add to what Dan has already said, what may not be well known is the uh, process that most factories and suppliers have to go through in order to do business with particularly the major uh, retailers and suppliers of, uh, of apparel. First and foremost, being, approved, being an approved vendor is an entire process to ensure that certain standards are being uh, upheld. The second aspect is factory certification. So in order to be able to sell to a Target, a Walmart, an Old Navy, Gap uh, company, these companies have to go through a, an approval process to be able to ensure that they are uh, adhering to safety standards and human rights requirements. That discipline, as Dan has pointed out, has to be enforced. And in most cases, with most of the major retailers, there's a very strict inspect inspection process and uh, requirements that are followed to ensure that the process is being utilized, that the uh, factories are complying with what they've agreed to do on the front end. Unfortunately, in some small countries that are developing may not have the enforcement, but yet the major retailers tend to have a rather strict enforcement process that they follow that will ensure that the factories that are being used are adhering to the requirements to be an approved vendor as well as being a, an approved factory. If that is not taking place, which obviously was not the case as you pointed out, Dan, in this particular case in Bangladesh, that particular factory should never have been approved in the first place because it would not have passed what most major retailers have on the front end as a requirement for doing business. So first and foremost, I would say that the approval process of most major retailers helps ensure that the majority of the factories, in fact, there's actually zero tolerance for not being able to uh, ad adhere to the policies of both a, a supplier, approval supplier, as well as a uh, factory. So the real issue is whether or not 
the retailer that is using that factory has put in place a process for vendor approval and factory certification that adheres to safety standards and to human rights uh, standards. If not, they shouldn't be doing business with them in the first place. Okay, uh, Dennis, um, it seems that these supply chains uh, for apparel, especially as they go to uh, Southeast Asia, have become very complex. It's more than just a transaction between a buyer and a seller. There's agents involved, and there's uh, transshippers involved, and there's representatives involved. For example, at H&M, the, the Swedish retailer, uh, some of whose labels were found on the, in the rubble of the Rama Plaza building, uh, has said that their order for that production um, was not an official order. It was transferred to that firm by an agent. Um, so does this happen frequently? And uh, is this a contribution to some of these problems? Okay, uh, let me separate what might be an H&M situation. And again, I don't know the specifics of H&M, so I will try to talk about major retailers versus smaller retailers. H&M is a relatively small retailer in the, in the overall apparel industry, as opposed to a Target or a Gap Corporation or a Walmart. So first and foremost, uh, let me go back to the complexity of sourcing. The reality is that sourcing has become more simplified because of having both direct sourcing as well as the uh, approval rate of a factory uh, and being an approved supplier. These suppliers have to be able to achieve not just the appropriate cost for product, but they must also be able to uh, provide a supply chain that is very disciplined and very efficient. Most of the major uh, retailers, in fact all the major retailers I'm familiar with, have very high standards on uh, levels of efficiency and standards of performance. So if you're a major supply, uh, retailer, your expectation is that you'll be able to produce product at a competitive price, not necessarily the lowest price, but a competitive price, and be able to ship that on time of the right quality that's been agreed upon and be able to have it on the retail floor of the retailer within a specific uh, time period. That's the standard of operating. That's the price of admission to be able to perform at that level. Unfortunately, sometimes you have a smaller retailer who may be not dealing with a direct, a factory direct, may be going through an agent and in that situation, they may not have the same kind of controls and disciplines built in. So you could have a situation that is very different than a target working with a major supplier uh, with approval and standards built within and check marks and, and, and inspections. You may have a situation where a uh, manufacturer uh, is been, has been used as a subcontractor without the knowledge of the retailer. A smaller retailer may not have the, the process in place to inspect and double check on those kinds of decisions. And if that takes place, which is not normally approved by, uh, certainly not, must have approval by a major retailer on the front end. But if that does take place, and it does take place with smaller uh, companies, then you could have a situation where a, subcon a subcontractor is utilized that does not have approval by the retailer, and it may not be with the knowledge of the retailer that it has been subcontracted, and then you are open to things where you have a situation where the standards are not being upheld. And in that case, you're very vulnerable to violations in human rights and safety issues. Well, that, that helps, helps me understand things a lot. Uh, thanks. Uh, Dan, do you have anything to add to that? I think um, I agree with Dennis's point that there are movements by especially large retailers to establish these global standards for their sourcing partners. Uh, but I, I do think that Dennis is taking a, a perspective based on his interaction with businesses and my interaction with uh, Asian manufacturers. I've seen to some degree the idea that you have one face that you present when you're making the agreement or when you're interacting with your partner, and then maybe you have a different face when that partner's not there. And I think what sometimes can happen uh, as this gets more and more complicated is there's just more and more distance involved in the process. Uh, 
distanced not just geographically, but culturally, uh, politically, economically, a language perspective. So you're manufacturing your product not in a neighboring state, or not three states over, but all the way across the globe in a country that's fundamentally different from where you are, with management practices that are fundamentally different and perspectives that are fundamentally different. So uh, let me follow up on that, on that conversation a bit for the benefit of our viewers who may not be intimately familiar with the relative scale of these companies. Um, and we said that Bangladesh uh, annual uh, garment apparel manufacturing production was in the neighborhood of $20 billion. Now, um, to help us understand the scale of that, how, how much retail volume in apparel would a company like Walmart do or Target do? And then on the other hand, how much would a, a smaller, even global, smaller retailer like H&M or Zara or Uniqlo do? What, what are the relative scales here? Well, uh, the individual volume by category of business is not published by Walmart or Target. But let me see if I can respond to the question in, in, in this regard. Uh, if H&M domestically is about $1.5 billion, let's compare that to Walmart, which is a corporation is rapidly approaching half a trillion dollar company, 500 or nearly $500 billion. Uh, a Old Navy division of Gap Corporation, Old Navy's uh, published retail business is about $5.2, $5.4 billion. Uh, I had the opportunity to lead a, a division within Walmart uh, that I can talk about now that had a men's division that was over $5 billion. So when you start looking at that scale and then comparing it to a company that is a total company, is only doing about 1.5 billion. 1.5 billion is a lot of money, but relative to the industry, it's small. And when you take Bangladesh, which is doing $20 billion totally, and that $20 billion is spread out over a rather large number of different retailers, these are relatively small businesses. So when you put it in perspective, you have a situation where the risk factor on that factory to lose an order from someone who is this small versus someone that may represent a very large percentage of their total business, that puts a little different perspective and a different pressure and actually helps influence that supplier, that manufacturer, to adhere to the standards and expectations that should be taking place. Does that help? Yes, it helps a lot. Dan, any other observations on that issue of scale and power? I think there's also a context um, at a country level. So Bangladesh, their only ball in the game is textile production. It's uh, around 80% or so of all of their exports. Um, about 70% of the entire economy in Bangladesh is in agriculture. It's the least developed country and it's primarily rural um, agriculture workers. But out of that remaining 30%, three-fourths of them are in the textile industry. So three-fourths of all the what we would kind of consider jobs in the developing world in Bangladesh are in the textile industry. And then their second largest industry after textiles is shipbuilding to help ship those products to uh, export those products to countries. So when you're talking about scale and you're trying to get some perspective on this issue and this problem, I think it's important to realize the role that textiles play in Bangladesh. If uh, the apparel uh, manufacturing uh, industry in Bangladesh is $20 billion, 80% of their exports, and it accounts for a, for a large proportion of the country's employment, uh, I would think that the government officials and the business officials and leaders would be incented to meet those standards that Dennis talked about so that they could attract more volume and, and, and not lose the business they've got. So, so why aren't these standards being enforced? Why aren't these standards being, um, being es established and, and, um, and followed in these factories? Dan, you want to take it first? Or? Uh, Dennis, why don't you go first one, I think. I, the, uh, there is the incentive that if you're going to participate, if you're going to develop the business, you're going to have to step up and be competitive with those standards. That's the bottom line. And most of the governments that uh, these major retailers do business with are very much aware that that's the expectation. Uh, 
So you are seeing changes that take place. The standards that may have existed in China 15 years ago had changed dramatically over the last 15 years. They've changed dramatically just in the last five years. The standards that exist in Indonesia have changed dramatically in the last five years. The standards that exist in South and Central America have changed dramatically. And part of that has been because the business leaders within those countries know that they have to step up to be able to be a participant, pay the price to, for of admission. But they are also getting support from governments many times that subsidize these factories and help them achieve improvements in their factories or, in, or if there's safety violations, safety issues or construction of factories, uh, dormitories, whatever. Or it, it's not uncommon to see that uh, some support takes place. So the countries are, do respond, both from a political standpoint and from a government standpoint, as well as the owners of the factories. So they do realize that they have to do it if they're going to be able to develop that business. Unfortunately, you have cases where it's not being done or a case where it wasn't being done properly and you have a disaster. If anything, the, the disaster that recently took place in Bangladesh would force the government to take a more active role to help subsidize factories, to help ensure that the standards are being achieved because they recognize without being able to adhere to those standards, they're not going to get the business and they're going to lose the tax base, the, the growth opportunities for the development of their industries within their own country. So it's a situation where they just have to. And if they're not going to, they recognize they will not develop this segment of their business and their economy. Yeah, and, and, and I agree with Dennis, and I think it's important to note uh, that these are the exceptions, not the rule. That Bangladesh has around 5,000 factories manufacturing textiles, and this was one or two bad actors um, and this is not the typical activity in Bangladesh, China, Indonesia, El Salvador, whatever country we want to be talking about that, that does do this global, as part of this global sourcing. And Bangladesh is a sophisticated textile producer. They've been doing this since 1997, 1977-76. Uh, so they've been involved in this as long as I've been alive, basically. So they're a sophisticated country, um, a sophisticated producer within the textile industry. That said, I think uh, global standards are not how these um, companies differentiate or compete. It's a baseline that once met, then you can start to compete on other standards. If it was based solely on meeting these standards of worker safety, these other issues, you still see a lot of textile manufacturing in developed countries, and you don't. You don't see developed countries doing much textile manufacturing. It's a very small percentage, very small numbers. So once you meet that standard, you're kind of allowed to play in the game. And then you're competing based on price. And that's why you see this global, global movement of production to the newest kind of low cost country, uh, what's sometimes referred to again as the China price. In the past, uh, large buyers, typically retail chains, uh, you know, uh, faced one of two options when maybe a factory that they were working with has had some kind of a, a problem, a safety problem. One option would be to just cancel the orders and go to the next factory or maybe the next region or maybe the next country to, to seek a safer haven. Uh, the other option may be to stay with that factory and maybe even make an investment in that factory to help with the capital to get it up to standard. Now how does the company make that decision? Well, first let's go back to the effort on the front end in that in order to do business to start with, you have to get approval to be an approved supplier. And there are a lot of requirements in order to do that. You must be able to uh, not only uh, be a good producer, but you've got to be able to work with uh, systems that exist within the individual retailer, whether it be to Target or Walmart. So you have to have a certain capability to be able to do business. So that is part of the process of being an approved supplier. The second part is the approval process that you have to go through in order to be a certified factory. And that is a requirement that you must be able to complete successfully or you will not be approved, period, to produce. Most of the major uh, retailers will work with a factory that may have a minor violation 
to the standard. And a minor violation, they may get, uh, some companies have a factory that is approval, has a, approved, and they call it the green approval process. And they may not have to be inspected, but once every two years. But if they have a minor violation, they might be classified as, some companies call it a yellow rating. And they have to get the uh, correct, make the correction on whatever problem, minor problem they have. Uh, and that is corrected. And they will be inspected at least uh, once a year, if not more frequently. But then there are cases where you have a factory that may be uh, redlined as not being uh, approved, and that would terminate not only the business that may have been originally established, but would cancel all future business with that factory. The retailer will not do business with it. So that's the first aspect of it. Now, in working with a factory, it is not unusual for a major retailer to sit down with a factory and work on an annual commitment. And by doing an annual commitment and saying, we will support 80% of your production, or we will support 70% of your production, that enables a supplier to be able to have a confidence level of getting loans or getting financing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to invest in their factory to get improve standards and to be able to get product uh, and sourcing of raw materials at a better price that it helps them from a standpoint of their growth and development to be able to do more business. So there's a combination of factors of one, the initial process, and then the investment in that factory from a standpoint of guaranteeing production. And after, if a factory can get uh, a 70, let's say a 70 or 80% uh, commitment on their annual production, then that pretty well sets a factory up for being able to run a profitable business. And the other 20% that they may get, they may be able to uh, do runs for other, another retailer where they might actually be able to get a higher price because they've been able to source product at a lower cost that other retailers may not be aware of that is built into the cost for that other 20% of their business. So there's a combination of how you can work with a factory that will enable the individual manufacturer to not only have a confidence level to invest in their factory, but actually act, actually help them improve their own profitability. It is in the best interest of the retailer to have profitable, good factories. It is not in their best benefit to have poor and poorly run factories. Dan? Well, I, I, I agree with a lot of what Dennis said, and, and I would build on it a, a little bit in that as is obvious from his discussion, there's a lot of sunk cost, upfront costs in this process, where you're certifying, where you're going through this approval process. It takes time, it takes money, it takes effort, it establishes relationships, um, and relationships, are, I think, are a key component of this process that are often lost. There's one-on-one -on -one interactions, and in least developed countries like Bangladesh, a lot of businesses around those relationships. So to get to your question, Dan, um, I think often it's difficult to, to leave a country particularly, but even stop a relationship. Um, now, if you have an extreme example like this Bangladeshi example, obviously you're gonna stop. Um, but to, to stop all your other relationships with manufacturers within a country, uh, that you've spent all this money and time and effort, and you may have two decade old relationship with a really high quality manufacturer that is providing a real high quality product, to stop that relationship because of another bad actor in a whole different potentially part of the country, that would be um, unusual and probably a bad business decision. Uh, and I think there's also um, a brand component to this. Mm -hmm. There's a brand image component to this. And you can see in some cases where companies take real strong action because they feel like their brand is being impacted. And a lot of that's upfront action to protect the brand from these sort of tragedies or problems, but it can also be post. So you've seen Apple do some things in response to the Foxconn suicides and changing some of their sourcing and not using Foxconn uh, for some of their manufacturing now. You've seen Nike take very aggressive steps um, around sweatshops and, and that sort of reputation because that got very strongly attached to the brand in the early 90s mm -hmm. and it's still there. I'll have an 18 year old in class that knows about Nike and sweatshops and that's almost 20 years old now. Uh, so I think there's a brand component of this and companies sometimes can be very, very protective of their brand and maybe in those cases they may take more extreme steps. So uh, Dan, I've got a complicated question for you here so I'm going to read, read some of it. 
A number of European retailers, including H&M from Sweden, Inditex from Spain, Tesco from the UK, Benetton from Italy, the usual European suspects, um, created an agreement that was designed to improve safety uh, standards and the enforcement of standards and wage issues uh, among the factories they deal with. And, and these, the disagreement that the, the signatories signed up on had some legally binding agreements or uh, conditions. Very few re U.S. retailers uh, agreed to sign that agreement. Instead, companies like Walmart, The Gap, JCPenney, Sears Holdings, and others preferred to work among themselves with their trade associations, the National Retail Federation, and with the Bipartisan Policy Center in Washington, D.C., to develop their own plan, which will be announced uh, soon, sometime early July. So, two questions here. Why do you think the U.S. retailers were unwilling to, to, to sign the European plan? And uh, secondly, do you think that maybe, what would it take for the Europeans to be willing to sign the U.S. plan? Um, I told you it was complicated. But it is. You're the expert on international marketing, so it's appropriate. Well, and, and I have, again, a complicated response to okay. a complicated question. So I think one of the main drivers are reasons for the American retailers being uncomfortable signing uh, the, the agreement was just a, a difference between legal systems between kind of the, the Eurozone, the European Union, and the United States. And the United States has the highest number of lawyers per capita. We have a fairly litigious uh, country, our, our legal system. Um, and beyond that, we have some different laws around liability, around the ability to do class action suits. Uh, uh, so the legal implications for U.S. retailers are different than they would be for the European retailers. Uh, I was reading a, an article in the journal that was talking about the potential for a Bangladeshi class action suit, uh, Bangladeshi workers against Walmart, and that this could potentially, probably a small chance, but could potentially be a result of this. Uh, so the legal system difference is one of the drivers. There's also just a, uh, a relationship with government and a cultural difference. American businesses tend to like to self-regulate, a little less comfortable with government action. European businesses are more comfortable with government regulation and have a higher expectation of government getting involved and playing that role. So I think there, there are a couple different things uh, driving the, the U.S. retailers not signing on. In the case of the European retailers, I think that's a hard question until we know exactly what that end agreement is yeah. and how binding it is, what the terms are, what the implications would be. Uh, I do know, uh, based on previous discussion, some of the people involved in the agreement, um, the National Retail Federation, Olympia Snow, the, the current senator, George Mitchell, and these are, uh, as we phrased it, heavy hitters. These are, these are big names. So I imagine something is going to come from this, uh, and it's probably going to be something that's pretty comprehensive, and I wouldn't be surprised if the European retailers jumped on. Uh, lastly, I think there's, there's a separate issue regarding consumers as well. I talked earlier that I didn't feel like consumers were that sensitive to this issue. Those consumers that are, are more likely to be located in Europe. So I think European retailers mm -hmm. needed to take quicker action to respond to this issue. I think there were more concerns in the European market among consumers over this problem than there was in the American market. So I think they, from a public relations, from a brand perspective, they wanted to move quickly. And I think the American retailers were in a space that they could take a little more time. Yeah, you know, and it's also the fact that, that, that the two sets of labels that were found in the Rubble Plaza of Rubble were a European and yeah. H&M and Benetton labels, right. and a little more pressure. So what's different now? I mean, what's, what's changed uh, to, to make people think that, that this change has caused these, or at least contributed to the pressures on these factories? Well, then there has been a significant change. Uh, many years ago, you had a situation where the manufacturer dictated the length of, for example, the length of a woman's skirt. This season being 26 inches and the next season being 32, the next season being 42 inches. And as a result of that, that's how they were able to obsolete the wardrobe that the individual had and help drive business. But at some point in time, the consumer said, stop, I'm going to wear the length of skirt in which I'm comfortable and the consumer took control. And as a result of that change, the consumer started to dictate to the supplier as opposed to the supplier dictating to the consumer. That changed the entire industry. And most manufacturers 
uh, of substance were able to make the transition and, and made the change to where they were responding to the consumer and being more consumer driven as opposed to many suppliers who also did not try to uh, or successfully make the transition and ended up not surviving. And that's why one of the reasons why the industry has shrunk as much as it has because the consumer took control. As a result of that, you now have a situation where the consumer is dictating not just the length of their skirt, but everything that is taking place with their wardrobe. And that is not a universal point of view. Because of the diversity of the population, you have diversity in fashion. So where one group of uh, customers may want a skirt length of 32 inches, another one may want one that's 26 inches. And that diversity has added to a great deal of excitement and innovation and, and, and uh, I think progress in the way that people view their wardrobe and the way they live, their lifestyles. And that's being reflected throughout all aspects of, I think, the population today, which has made it, in my opinion, a much more exciting place to live. It, in, it basically celebrates differentiation and differences and yet keeps us as a universal population. So it's actually been a very healthy thing, but it is no longer being dictated, fashion is no longer being dictated by suppliers, it's being dictated by the consumer. And I believe that's healthy. Yeah, and I agree with Dennis uh, in that consumers are, have taken more control. Consumers may not feel like it, but they really are driving the bus, if you will. And this is across all industries, essentially. It's not just the textile industry. Consumers have more and more power. Uh, but I feel like that this puts some pressure on the system as well. If you, uh, there's a classic business school model of rivalry among competitors, Michael Porter's five forces. And one of those forces is the bargaining power of consumers. And as consumers have more bargaining power, competition gets more fierce. Rivalry among competitors gets more fierce. And this puts pressure on the system. And as systems get more pressure on them and there's more competition, that increases the incentive to potentially cut a corner. Uh, hopefully nobody would do that, but it does increase the pressure to make those, uh, take those sort of steps. I also think technology and technological changes have played a key role. Uh, I was at a uh, Taiwanese research and development company and they had gotten essentially an email from Nike headquarters and they printed out a, a 3D shoe for me to hold, and this was the newest LeBron shoe. So you have this technological role that it's increasing the ability of manufacturers to respond to these different consumer markets. They can be more responsive, they can be more efficient, they can customize and make changes more quickly. And I think that's an important change that should be noted over the last couple of decades. So if, if the consumer is driving the ship, why don't they drive the ship to safer factories and higher wages in other words, take a course that doesn't put such pressures for, or incentives, if you will, for some cost cutting and uh, corner cutting and, and uh, lax enforcement. Uh, if they've got the power, why don't they do something about it? You want to take that? Sure. Um, to some degree, they have. To some degree, the standards and the processes that Dennis has been talking about are um, in response to consumer pressures. Some of them are in response to uh, just best practices, doing the moral or the right thing by companies, but some are in response to those consumer pressures. Uh, companies don't want to be in a position where they are repeat offenders and they are repeatedly in stories such as this tragedy in Bangladesh. That would hurt their brand image over time and you could see consumers start to migrate away from those companies. Uh, and you see micro segments of consumers within Europe, within the American market that, that won't buy at Walmart because they feel Walmart uh, pays a low wage, they feel that Walmart is, is uh, not a good business actor, or they may uh, prefer not to buy uh, from big box stores in general. So there are certainly pockets of consumers that exert a lot of pressure on these issues. So I, I wouldn't say that consumers are not, aren't playing a role and, and aren't putting a lot of pressure on uh, uh, businesses. But I think there's also the, the counter fact that I don't know how sensitive consumers are to the issue. I think if it was repeat offenders, if it was something that was happening over and over again, there would be a lot more sensitivity. But when they seemed like isolated incidents where it's a foreign owned company and, and uh, there are quick steps in response, I don't know how many consumers really are making their purchasing decision based on country of origin. 
I don't know how many consumers went out and were shopping at Walmart or Target and looked at the t-shirt and said, oh, this was manufactured in Bangladesh, I'm not gonna buy it. I'm not sure how many pe people are actually that sensitive. I think it's a good point because the reality, the consumer expects the retailer to maintain the standards of expectation. And as a result of that, the major retailers, particularly the larger retailers, have taken ownership and I think a much higher level of citizenship and leadership in standards of operating and standards of sourcing and uh, factory certification programs. Uh, those kinds of things have now become much more a part of the norm of this is the price of entry to do business today. You no longer hear about the cases of child labor or factory certification programs that uh, still tolerate uh, the uh, kind of things that may have taken place even 20 years ago. So the standards have been improved because they've had to be improved in order to protect the brand and the major retailers. Uh, Walmart, a Target, a, a Gap Corporation is not going to risk their entire company, their business, by doing something stupid short uh, or short term, short range. Uh, it, it just doesn't, it's not good business. It's good business to actually raise the standard and that's the expectation of the consumer. Well, you know, I think um, if I may add something or take my own perspective, uh, one of the nice things about being in charge is that you're in charge. So you can demand everything. So I think uh, the attitude the consumer, at least subconsciously, is uh, I, want the, I, I want the fashions I want and styles, colors. I want them as quickly as, as I want to have them. I want to change them uh, you know, four, five, six times a year because that's the way I want to do things. And I want to pay a tiny price for them. And oh, by the way, of course I expect them to, to have these, the, these garments made in, in, um, under conditions of good human rights and labor rights and so on and so forth. My job is to choose what I'm going to buy. It's, it's the retailer's job to choose where and how they make it. Absolutely. Absolutely. I would add one last thought on this um, from an international marketing perspective. And that is, uh, in the next 10 to 20 years, we're going to see the emergence of Chinese retailers, Brazilian retailers, uh, Indian retailers, uh, and their expectations on these issues are, are going to be different. Uh, in Bangladesh, for example, there is an issue with child labor, but those companies aren't manufacturing for Western companies. Those factories are manufacturing often for other emerging markets that have different expectations around these issues and different standards. So it'll be an interesting uh, to watch the story evolve over time as these other economies become more global players. It's a very good point, uh, Dan. But what I'm finding internationally is that as economies develop, the expectation of quality is rising. The expectations of the consumer continues to improve and, and reach a higher level, much like the history of what took place within our own country. So I believe as time goes on, the standards of expectation are going to continue to rise just as they have in this country and in other developed countries. Uh, because second standard uh, working conditions are not going to be acceptable in any country at some point in time. Not the case today, but this becomes much more of a true global economy, much more of a true global consumer with great differentiation, different taste levels, different desires, different admirations and ambitions, but they're still being manifested in common quality uh, ways of production and the way you live your life. You know, if we look at this thing in a very simple way, which I think we see in many of the popular uh, press articles, there's, there's, there's two fairly obvious solutions. One is uh, the retailer, the buyer, can say, yes, I realize that it's going to cost the factory a little bit more per unit piece uh, to manufacture at these standards. I'll pay the price. I'll take the hit on my bottom line. That's one option. Another option might be, well, I know the factory's going to have to make some capital investment to get their facilities up to standard. I'll provide some of that capital or arrange for the financing for some of that capital. What are the implications of that? 
So what do you think? Is it that simple? Well, I think, I think it's, it's not that simple, obviously. Um, one, I think the, the cost number uh, might be greater than people realize. One number that I found uh, just in reading about this topic for personal interest was that meeting uh, the ILO standards uh, would cost around $3 billion if we did it countrywide in Bangladesh. That's a major expense. Now, what those standards are, how those relate to the, the standards that Dennis has been talking about, whether those are realistic, that's a whole separate question. But the investment is, is more than just a marginal increased cost uh, uh, per unit. It, it is a big number, uh, potentially. Second, I think people think, well, why don't you just start running your own factories in Bangladesh or set up your own shop? That's a real difficult thing to do. I mean, there may be regulatory things in place that don't allow foreign companies to have ownership. Only around 5% of all the manufacturers in Bangladesh are foreign owned. So they're 90 95% domestic. And then it's difficult to manage a factory full of Bangladeshi workers from a different culture, different language, different legal structure, different political structure. It's just a lot harder to do. And you start to move down a very complicated role, uh, road when you're saying, I'm gonna be 25% owner I'm going to have a 25% investment in your factory to ensure that you're meeting standards. That sounds great in, in an editorial, but it's really difficult to do in practice. I, I think there's great points. I think there's another factor that we're uh, looking at, and it's what I would call the productivity cycle. Because the reality is, is you may increase cost from a standpoint of raising standards, at the same time, raising those standards may increase efficiency. You have less defectives, you have a better, you can improve the flow of raw materials, etc. And there's a thing called productivity cycle that basically says that as you continue to get more efficient, your cost can go down and you continue to lower costs. And that's why the history within our own country, we've seen productivity dramatically improve and costs continue to decline. So as long as we're able to achieve increased productivity, we actually are in a position to be able to improve quality at a lower cost. And that productivity cycle actually provides lower cost. It does not negatively impact profitability. It may be on a percentage basis, it goes down, but on a dollar basis, it goes up. So you have to look at that aspect of it because it does impact, and many companies do actually operate on a, what's called mm -hmm. the productivity cycle process that lowers that cost but increases their overall volume and they end up in a very big win situation, not only for the factory but also for the consumer. Do, do any of the big, um, the big retail buyers uh, own either partially or fully any of, any of those factories in Southeast Asia? Uh, what, what's their general position on that? My understanding is that they like to leave it kind of at arm's length. My experience is that you try to develop long-term relationships with good factories that you're able to work with on a consistent basis and build up that volume and lower overall uh, cost through efficiencies which then enables you to have a great deal of influence and control mm -hmm. with your overall productivity and, and production process without having to make the capital investment. And my experience is that that has proven to be a better business model than having to make the capital expenditures. There's also, in some countries, issues related to ownership of, yeah. of uh, companies that can impact those decisions. But generally speaking, I would rather be able to influence a factory than rather have to put out the capital to own a factory. Is there a regulatory component to this issue? Uh, is there some way, uh, some important role for government influence to play? Um, for example, uh, some have argued that the, that, that the United States and the EU trade and state departments should put pressure on these companies to improve uh, their, their standards in these factories or they will lose some of their preferential uh, trade policies uh, one way or another. Um, is that a, do um, you think, a powerful force, uh, effective force? I think it's a very powerful force. I'm not sure if it's effective. Um, and let me explain why I say that. Uh, the textile industry is traditionally um, very regulated. Uh, 
um, and has a, a long tradition back to the mid 70s of global trade agreements and regulations around it. We had the uh, multi-fiber agreement um, through the UN in 1974, uh, which gave preferential status to some countries, set quotas. Uh, it was a complicated agreement, but it was one of the things driving the growth, for example, in Bangladesh of their textile industry, because it gave them some protected status. You saw the uh, WTO passed the agreement on, text, uh, agreement on textiles and clothing, which also gave Bangladesh some special protections um, and also influenced this, this process of global sourcing, global trade. And then uh, more recently, the United States entered an agreement with Bangladesh uh, stating it was one of 14 least developed countries that we wanted to encourage trade and development with and gave it duty-free export status to the United States um, from 2009 to 2019. So this is all a long way of, of kind of providing an overview of the complicated sort of regulatory environment. There really have been global agreements about the textile industry that have impacted the global market and Bangladesh specifically. So it's obviously powerful and there's obviously a lot of work around it. There's a question of effectiveness. Uh, there's questions of enforcement. There's questions around how much language in the MFA or in the ATC is around worker safety, labor rights, these sort of issues. And it's always a political debate. And often uh, it's a sticking point for these trade agreements. And the agreement goes through, but there's less language than some people would like around these other components of the agreement. And it's more around reducing barriers to trade than it is around establishing worker safety mm -hmm. or global policies. And then what happens is, as uh, Dennis has been discussing this whole time, it then defaults more to businesses to take action um, or hopefully consumers, or at least potentially consumers, yeah. because it's just such a complicated process to get a global system, every actor to agree on some of these issues. It's, uh, this may sound like apple pie and motherhood, but the reality is uh, it is in the best interest of the retailer to ensure that the necessary changes, compliance uh, issues are taken care of, uh, that they actually initiate them. Uh, whether Whatever the regulations may be, it generally has been more successful for the retailers to help drive those initiatives because they're much closer to what needs to be done and they understand that it is in their best interest to have these improvements take place. Uh, bad labor practices are not in the best interest of a retailer. They just don't improve productivity. They don't lower costs. And there's plenty of years of experience in manufacturing that bear that out. So taking shortcuts in the process of manufacturing and supply chain are not in the best interest of the consumer. They're not in the best interest of the provider. They're not in the best interest of the manufacturer. And that's been proven out over and over again. So the reality is that I think that uh, to some degree, I think the industry is doing a better job of policing itself and helping to raise the standards because it's in their best interest to do so. Well, this has been a very um, instructive uh, conversation and I, I've enjoyed it and, and learned a lot. And, and it sounds like you two fellows are in pretty much agreement in terms of the positive directions that things have been moving over the past couple of decades and, and, and continue to. You may not be in such great agreement in terms of the of the effectiveness on the ground in terms of enforcement and, and those sorts of things. And after all, we, we still have a factory that fell down in Bangladesh and killed 1,100 people and a factory that burned down killed 100 people. So um, where are we? Well, uh, first, thank you for the opportunity to come and talk, Dan. Dennis, this has been a very enjoyable process, uh, very educational. I think we're in a position where we're moving in the right direction. Uh, we're going through fits and starts. This is part of this emerging global economy and these countries that, as bad as things are in Bangladesh today, they're far better than they were before the textile industry entered. And this is part of this overall process as business becomes more and more global. And I think the encouraging thing for me as an educator is that there are places like Daniel's uh, there are institutes like the Institute that are focused on these ethical issues and that are emerging business leaders 
as well as, as um, our current business leaders, realize that ethics are part of being effective businessmen and women. Uh, I guess from a standpoint of looking at how things have changed from uh, probably before this young man was born, uh, over the last 45 years that I've been in retailing, the industry has dramatically changed where standards did not exist as far as human uh, relationships, uh, concern for how things were produced, where they were produced, uh, the quality requirements, it's, it's changed dramatically. And in today's world, it has dramatically changed. It's not even the same business that it was, uh, you know, 45 years when I, ago when I got into this business. So you've seen a continuous improvement and growth in the industry. You've seen a continuous improvement driven primarily by uh, the people doing business, whether it's you want to talk about a Walmart or a Target or a, a Dayton Hudson Group or the that originally started a number of initiatives. The whole industry has dramatically changed as a response to serving the consumer better. And quite frankly, the consumer has been the driving force. And fortunately, the people that continue to survive and grow are the ones that are listening to the consumer the best. And as long as we have that relationship, we, as long as we have the consumer driving the ship, we're in a win situation because the entire industry will continue to improve. Well, that's a positive note. I'm encouraged. Okay. Thank you, fellas. It's Thank been you. a good conversation. Thank you.